Good morning, and welcome to Meet the Candidates for New York City Council Speaker. My name is Jose Ortiz Jr., and I'm the CEO of the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. This morning, we have the pleasure of sitting down with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer for the second of our scheduled conversations with the City Council Speaker candidates. Thank you to the members and partners that have joined us to hear from the candidate. NYC ETC supports the workforce development community to ensure that every New Yorker has access to the skills, training, and education needed to thrive in the local economy, that every business is able to maintain a highly skilled workforce. NYC ETC's membership is composed of 190 workforce providers, education institutions, and labor management organizations that provide jobs and training and employment services to nearly 600,000 New Yorkers. Before we get started, all participants should know that you'll be muted for the duration of this call. Manhattan Borough President Brewer will be providing an opportunity to talk to us about her candidacy and answer some questions in a fireside format. We'll then open it up for a few questions from several members and partners. Please type in your questions along with your name, title, and organization throughout the conversation using the chat icon located on the bottom panel. If you're called upon to ask your question, we will unmute you so that you may ask your question directly to our guest. Please note that we will try our best to get to as many questions as time will allow. I wanna thank Manhattan Borough President Brewer for her leadership and for being here with us this morning. For some background, Gail Brewer is the 27th Borough President of Manhattan. She holds an MPA from Harvard Kennedy School of Government and did her under, undergraduate work at Columbia University and Bennington College. She took office in 2014 and has since then passed legislation to reform the deed restriction process, added caregivers to the city's anti-discrimination law, remove criminal history questions from initial employment applications and enforce requirements for street numbers on buildings in Manhattan to, to aid emergency workers. She has led community planning initiatives at South Street Seaport, East Midtown and other neighborhoods to address development and zoning issues. In 2018, Brewer served as the, as the chair of the Large Cities Council of the National League of Cities and was named a member of the 2019 Human Development Federal Advocacy Committee. Brewer previously served on the city council for 12 years, serving as a founding chair of the technology committee and leading the government operations committee. There, the council passed legislation granting paid sick leave for most hourly employees requiring a city data to be published online and protections for domestic workers from abusive practices. Prior to that, she served as chief of staff to council member Ruth Messenger, New York City deputy public advocate, director of the city's federal office and executive director of the Mayor's Commission on the Status of Women. And of last Tuesday, Brewer is the council member elect for New York City Council District 6. Manhattan Borough President Brewer, it's really wonderful to see you today. Congratulations again on your reelection. Thank you very much, Jose Ortiz. And I've learned what I know about workforce, not only from you, of course, because I'm always calling you, what should I be doing on workforce? But also the work that we did on the Fair Chance Act, which you and others were extremely helpful. Um, with Jamani Williams, we passed it. I don't think it would have happened without the backing of your amazing coalition. So I guess I'm supposed to say just a few minutes about myself, although you just said it all. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I will say, the, but people will say, why are you running for the city council? That's the question I get the most often. And I, and I think you answered it a little bit. The issue is I do have a lot of background that I want to contribute, but also to be honest with you, and I think your employment agency uh, duplication, for lack of a better word, is an example. I want government to work. That's why I ran, uh, I don't know, uh, 2001 for the same reason. And that's why I'm running today. In 2021, as we sit here today, uh, in certainly in the employment area, I don't know how many agencies, you know better than I, but it's at least 10 uh, work unemployment. And that makes no sense. They need to be uh, coordinated. Same thing with the streets. Um, you have uh, restaurants. I happen to love the open restaurants. Not everybody does, but you got restaurants, bicycles, bike lanes, sidewalks, pedestrian unloading. I could go on. You got 25 agencies there working on the state and the city level. So I want uh, those coordinations to take place. Number one. Number two, we have um, a huge, uh, as you know, uh, disconnect between poverty, jobs, and the way in which the city is going to recover. I always throw the arts in there, but that's not necessarily uh, part of today, although the arts provide millions of jobs, 92,000 on Broadway, just to give you an example. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm here to say, I, every time I talk to somebody, I all find myself saying, well, you got to look at this, you got to look at that. 
just because I've done it so often. So that's why I'm running to say, I have a lot of experience. Um, I am running for speaker because I have all this experience. I only want to do it for four years. Don't, if that's it, I'm done. But I want to be able to say to Eric Adams, we are always borough president buddies. Uh, five of us when Melinda Katz was still the borough president before pandemic get together for lunch. We always had to give him a special lunch, you know, because he likes green things. But definitely we had a lot of fun and we supported each other. And I, that's what I want to continue to do to support my colleagues. But actually workforce development, street activity for lack of a better word, are the worst in my opinion, in terms of coordination. You also have climate issues, sustainability, housing, the list is very long. But to me, um, the one topic that we're talking about today is a prime example of the city agencies and the state agencies, and now that we have the federal infrastructure, um, at least one half of it, if you could say, we need to have even more collaboration because if this money comes to our city, it is all about workforce development. So that's why I'm running. I don't need to go through the background. The only thing you can add is I teach at Hunter College um, and I've been doing that for about 25 years at different um, you know, uh, coordinated, um, I think I've done other, CUNY campuses and Barnard College, and I do love doing that. So that's why I'm running. It's great to hear. Thank you for the additional background. And, and I think, you know, your your experience is, is quite unique in terms of the other candidates in this race. And so I, I want to touch a little bit upon that. Um, and it will, you know, more specifically on the workforce piece. But, you know, I think the question is, you know, in two parts. One, obviously, what are the, the major priorities for workforce today? But I think next, that in that same question, what are the priorities that you've seen over the years that you just simply haven't seen fulfilled and we need to get the city to do in order to get the city back up and running in a more effective manner uh, uh, in which we uh, require for cities to work for today? Well, I mean, you're, uh, I think the city is only going to rebound if the workforce piece is solved. Obviously, uh, you and I have talked about this. You need some kind of a Marshall Plan because until yesterday or two days ago, I wasn't actually sure that the infrastructure bill was gonna pass, but now right. it has. And so I always, we actually in the borough president's office every Tuesday at three, we have either a vaccine and, or what about the federal money discussion? And now it's a real discussion. So to me, uh, even more importantly is your Marshall plan. These are the things you've told me, Jose Ortiz, um, figuring out how to map the development system so that you have a skills bank and a tool for workers I want to mention, obviously, you hear about technology all the time. And that's not the only aspect of workforce development. But I am excited about Civic Hall. It has a new name now. I can't remember what it's called. But it's going to be at what I call the PC Richards Building on 14th Street. That's not the name of it either. What, you know, Fed Cap is involved, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we need more of those. That's an example where workers can get skilled. Everybody needs technology. But that is not the only, only way. And of course, um, you have to be uh, the, all the training programs that need to be funded. And then you and I have talked, I, the CCCs, I am very upset that the community college is not part of the infrastructure uh, free. That's, I know it got left out, but that's upsetting to me as an example. Um, but we have to work with the community colleges and figure out the funding. I'm very big on CTE, which is the career technical education. Those high schools need a huge amount of help. I'm also always worried about uh, the disabled community um, and some of the programs that they have that Susan Shear and others have initiated. And then of course you have all the community-based organizations that you know only too well and that are part of your wonderful coalition. To me, um, there isn't any, I mean, there, the industries are clear there. Jonathan Bowles has listed for the last hundred years, every <laughs> industry that needs to be, uh, have workers, how they get there and where the good jobs are, but it doesn't seem to connect. So for me, the connection, the training, all the things that I just listed are the example of how the city can rebound. Um, you know, the arts are just one example, but there are so many other arts, technology, healthcare. The list is uh, very clear. Um, you, need the, you need the technology to go with it. I was very excited that, um, that the supportive housing groups are looking at technology. I didn't know that, that is part of the, supportive housing movement. That's really exciting to me, given my technology background. 
So you talked a little bit about the uh, the infrastructure bill, which obviously we're all thrilled uh, is, is passing and it's coming at the right time, obviously, in terms of new leadership uh, within the, the mayor's office, as well as the city council. And you talked about a number of different areas, uh, um, which obviously I think we're in agreement with with regards to um, you know, focusing on technology, some of the growth sectors, but also we have to focus on on areas that have been hit incredibly hard during the pandemic, where uh, a number of businesses obviously require additional support and, and services, and 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 uh, and uh, a real new uh, workforce that can meet their their changed uh, needs, which is you know the re new reality of the post COVID ec economy. Um, obviously, a major component of of the speaker's role is to negotiate the budget. How does workforce factor into to all of that, uh, given what you talked about earlier, in terms of some of those additional federal dollars and obviously uh, uh, the the city's current budget uh, with regards to workforce? It's my experience, and I don't know that this is correct, um, that if you're going to employ the people who have been most marginally employed, you really have to work with the community-based organizations. We could talk about CTE, we could talk about community colleges. Let me give an example. Right now, section three, which I think most people don't know what that is, your groups do, but it's obviously the NYCHA must do, doesn't do, should do program for if you're going to be hired as a contractor at NYCHA, you're supposed to fulfill section three. But as we're dealing with PACT and RAD, which I'm dealing with up to here in the Manhattan development, to be honest with you, and I can't say it's across the board because I don't know every single situation, but the contractors, meaning the construction developers are hiring, but they're firing Jose at the same time because there isn't that step in between of, okay, so uh, Mr. Jones is hired for, I don't know, local nine or whatever, the painters there, or you know, the electrical or whatever, or just the something to do with demolition, whatever the situation is, uh, but they're not keeping them. And so I don't know what's gonna happen after that. Are they gonna continue to hire others? Because to answer your question, to do those who are most in need of jobs, you have to have the community-based organizations mm -hmm. um, and to do the training, to do the support, to do, it doesn't work otherwise. So I, I don't know, I do know, for instance, Workforce One, which I used to have tons of problems with. Um, I do feel that they are now mandating, my understanding, because um, we do a lot of helping people get jobs, you apply, but then you must either virtually or in person meet with a counselor. You can't just look on your own. So there has to be a person while we're dealing with this training who is there to be of assistance in order to get those who need the jobs the most. And that's where I think, um, to answer your question, budget that has to be funded. Somebody has to be sure that there is whatever the scenario is in terms of a person who needs job to counselors or whatever the term is. You know, whether it's persons who are, uh, you know, veterans coming back because we know how important they are or people who are hopefully getting through Exodus or getting through Strive or whatever. But that, to answer your question, part of the recovery has to be, and I don't say that just because I'm talking to your members. Um, sure. You know, your, your members may or may not be working at NYCHA. <clears throat> and NYCHA has to do it. Somebody has to be there, you know, to be the uh, counselor to figure out the right job and if you need help getting the points off your license or you know the liens off your uh, you didn't pay your rent or figuring out what your skills are because it's not working right now with section three and that's just one small example um, th that I have examples of right now so right. I, I think the answer is funding for those organizations that will help those who need them and then you can figure out because this job is a dead-end job this job is a way to get uh, you know, figure it out for the future. This is a great apprenticeship. We know that's the best of all in terms of the construction unions, et cetera. And, you know, there's a lot of push to make sure that people get these apprenticeships and other kinds of jobs, but people forget they may not last in that job unless somebody's there to support them. Correct. Uh, so speaking about uh, construction and infrastructure, obviously there's an incredible opportunity to, to rebuild the city um, to meet specific needs that are, uh, you know, related to obviously just changing physical infrastructure <laughs> needs, um, climate and resiliency, um, things that uh, have long plagued the city as we physically, as we grow population-wise, but physically uh, can't meet the total needs of that population. Uh, and so there's a really an incredible opportunity to 
one, develop, but also simultaneously get people back to work. Getting the people back to work aside for a second, what are some of the major infrastructure uh, 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 projects that you feel that are, you know, that you're, you're interested in supporting or need to get done uh, with uh, some of the funds that have been allocated as a result of the federal dollars? Well, <clears throat> the papers today are full of all the transportation projects. Right. That includes uh, Gateway, that includes Second Avenue Subway, and there are probably many more that I'm not aware of, but those are the two Manhattan-based. So um, those are, are massive. I think it was $8 billion for Gateway, and I don't know how much for the subway. So getting New Yorkers uh, who are marginally employed or not employed now ready for those would be a priority. And those are obviously union jobs, so you have to work with the construction folks. And they want to work with us, but we have to be ready. The second is resiliency. Um, as an example, again, I'm, I do know I'm very Manhattan based, but I know that there are other projects, they're similar, but uh, the downtown area, which is Fidei and South Street has to have some kind of resiliency project. The mayor put in 110, or maybe 210, I can't remember a million. That's just the beginning. So the concept is to build out into the water, but not put housing on, it, et cetera. So that's another example. That's again, it's construction. And then we have the housing, which is beyond frustrating to me. I, I have spent, I don't know how many years trying to build affordable housing. It's the restoration of the hotels, it's building new housing, it's, it's a challenge. Not for the workers, it's a challenge for us trying to get more affordability. So uh, those are three examples. I think that um, they're, they're huge. And of course you have just the healthcare world, which is, uh, we're all getting older, um, Hopefully there'll be union jobs because home health care without a union is not a good job, at least in my opinion. And you have the, you know, the technology world, which is not just uh, coding, as you can, as uh, anybody will tell you who's in that world. It can be much more lucrative and much more demanding and could easily be trained. Those are just some. There, there's, there's um, you know, hospitality in general, which whatever reason seems to be begging for workers now. So the question is, how do you make an attractive job so that workers will participate? Uh, hospitality is a very large. I think as uh, nightlife comes back, um, Mayor Adams seems to love doing nightlife. So if, as nightlife comes back, that also has uh, lots of possibilities. That's not as much a training job as having good salaries and good jobs. The, right. the jobs are, are seem like with this bill, we're there, but we can really lose fast for getting the people who need the jobs if we're not ready. Um, you know, the community colleges are there ready, you know, all of the, with the, absolutely to answer your question, this is a moment, but we can lose the whole thing. And people with all due respect from, you know, uh, upstate New York and Florida and everywhere else could be here with these construction jobs if we're not ready. Correct. So you talked earlier in your opening remarks around kind of the, the fracturing of the city system uh, and mentioned that uh, um, New York City's workforce system is, is fractured and, uh, and it is obviously a major issue um, coming into the next administration. The, the city's workforce system is in fact divided up more than 20 uh, different agencies and, and offices and departments, which is uh, speaks to, I think, a lot of the different issues that we've seen over the course of the, the last many years, which is in any situation where so many organizations or, or um, departments are responsible for something, it's the priority of everyone and the priority of no one simultaneously. And so um, to, to that point, what, would, what are some of the recommendations that you think we need to do in order to ensure that the city's workforce system is just simply more uh, uh, effectively uh, consolidated to, to get us, um, get folks back to work? Well, I mean, you, you can have um, uh, DOE, uh, we haven't even talked about Department of Education. Sure. You can have DOE, you can have, and they do, if you count CTE, et cetera, as well as other aspects, they have employment. Uh, SBS, small business has employment. DYCD has employment. This, uh, nobody, puts a connection between that and EDC, which is sometimes, which is the mapping for the jobs, tells them what the jobs are. Um, City Planning Commission uh, talks about development and plans supposedly for the city of New York. So some entity has to have employment, it used to under it. That, that was, I think Bloomberg or maybe before separated these agencies out. Gave it to SBS at one point, I think actually it was still at DYCD at one point. So I would suggest that an, an employment agency exists and that you pull out all of these uh, different, as you say, 20, I didn't know it was that many, but whatever the number is, and you can count the state too, state's got employment possibly, 
possibilities. And then you have to figure out how to deal with the MBE, WBE. You have to figure out how to deal with, um, you know, the, the, the college programs, all of the CUNY programs now often have an employment possibility. You've got the, uh, you know, the work that goes on in terms of uh, college students, they too have employment situations that CUNY does, et cetera. Somebody has to look at all of this and say, how do they connect? So the answer to your question is that would be to me, that would be an a oversight of the city council immediately and of anybody who's leading that entity to work with the mayor's office to make sure that happens. I mean, I can give you an example of, um, at, I'm a, you know, I spent hours at NYCHA and I'm at a family day the other day. This isn't just workforce, but it's related. I, I was beside myself. And these PAC programs have young, good developers, often of color. And then you have the staff of NYCHA. I'm sitting there in the Harlem at a family day. The tenants are over to the side. And, and the, I say to the developer, you know, because these are renovated scatter site NYCHA buildings. I said, oh, are you doing anything, you know, just trying to make conversation on sustainability? Oh, yes, said this gentleman. I'm doing research. I went, oh, no. And then I said, because he doesn't know anything about sustainability. And then I said to the NYCHA employees, are you doing anything about waste management? You know, you have a whole division. Oh, really? Says the person from NYCHA. So here we go. There's a huge office of sustainability in the mayor's office. There's a huge office of waste management in the NYCHA. Nobody talks to anybody else. And that is similar um, because in both cases, there's workforce development in green jobs right there. But if you don't talk to somebody, you have no idea how to put them all together. And we could have a whole conversation about green jobs. But um, the answer is one office, everything under it, at least coordinated, and figuring out how to actually talk about green jobs, how to talk about infrastructure jobs, and the training that goes with them. Section three example, that would be something that I would put under it, not through NYCHA, as an example. So, that, so, yeah, thank you for that response. And I think, uh, you know, one of the uh, responses essentially to the 20 plus agencies being monitored is actually there's around nine different uh, uh, city council committees that are responsible for all these different workforce initiatives and employment services. Would you support the creation of a, a committee for workforce on the city council? Absolutely. I mean, some absolutely into, you know, working with your coalition to figure out what would be the best ways to approach the hearings and the oversight, et cetera. Absolutely. I mean, you know, this drug training, pro, drug treatment pro programs do training. It's so, you know, Oasis funds it. it you got to have something that is uh, mirrors what the city should be doing. The answer to your question is yes. You talked a little bit about sustainability uh, before. Obviously, I think there's a lot to talk around around green jobs. Uh, and, and I think that is, uh, increasingly of importance, obviously, due to the devastation that the city has experienced over the last many months uh, with, uh, you know, recent tropical storms and hurricanes. There was about $5.6 million that was uh, shared specifically, or, or in fact, it might be larger than that for the cleanup core um, and, and jobs that really were focused on essentially just, you know, temporarily beautifying the city and, and quality of life concerns. But I think as we think longer term, we need to be thinking, obviously, about you know, structural issues that, that exist and, and not so much strictly about these types of you know, you know, low, uh, light touch quality of life issues, but really long term sustainability for New York City. Um, where do you see uh, uh, the future of kind of green economy or resiliency jobs going uh, in, under your administration? Well, I take, I take cues from we act and Peggy Shepard heavily, just in terms of people who have been doing the work. Um, mm -hmm. I remember recently I went to a uh, HDFC roof, you know, and to her credit, there were uh, people who had actually put the solar in and, you know, the, the HDFC was going to save money. That's just one. We ha we're absolutely nowhere. So I have um, no idea how to get uh, the state, I would believe, would have to do a lot more uh, carrot and stick, uh, perhaps carrots for making more solar uh, opportunities for homeowners and multifamilies and co-op all the and the commercial. So that is one. You have to make it more interesting. Apparently in New Jersey, I have friends, actually have friends who live in New Jersey, not too many, but I have a few. And they are actually do have a very big incentive for doing solar. So we got to figure out, obviously, to make it solar, we got to figure out all of the uh, local law 97, which is uh, supposed to be uh, 
go into effect. People are squawking because it's expensive. So, but all of these are going to require jobs and all of these are going to require refitting or rebuilding or just building per, in the beginning. Um, so I would say that all of this has to be a company. That's why I keep going back to the training. Um, in addition to all of this, you're doing the resiliency. So there are many opportunities. The question is matching the two. So you don't just have the same old people doing the work. It's very easy to have the same old people doing the work. Let me be clear. So the question is how to make sure you have the training component to go with it. We, there's a lot of talk about green jobs, but I haven't seen a lot of funding uh, except for WEAC and maybe there are others, I don't know, that are actually doing the work from the community perspective. Um, I wanna also you know, mention if we have more, um, I hope, uh, you know, supportive housing, low-income housing, I really love supportive housing, um, then you would have, hopefully those two would be done in a appropriate fashion, but it's not gonna happen unless there is the, I'd like to happen with the kinds of training and employment that we're talking about with the green jobs. It's a massive uh, undertaking to do the right thing, but that's how it should be done. Green jobs are, um, you know, possible, but I do, I, I worry constantly that if we're not really proactive about uh, making sure that people have the training and the support, then, they're not, then the wrong people are going to end up with those jobs. We also yeah. have the, the marijuana business or whatever it's called, right, in terms of jobs. Um, and that's another possibility. Again, there's tons of uh, work that could uh, be available there, but it has to be done in a way that people get trained to do it. Yeah, we, uh, just two more questions before we open it up to our, our members for a couple of questions. But you, you've been a big supporter of the technology sector for a long time. And, and I know your support uh, for the work that is uh, being done at Civic Hall and other areas of the city. Um, what, do, what do you see some of the, the major uh, roles that technology can play in really the development of our city. And I, and I you know, would add to that, obviously, the, you know, for a large portion of the population in, in our city and really across the state and the country, digital poverty remains an issue. There's a significant divide. People don't have necessary you know, quality broadband, hardware, software for them to earn and learn from home. What do we need to do uh, and uh, how can we use technology to you know, increasingly make the city more effective? But two, how do we get more people to be able to contribute and participate? in that process? There's a couple of things. We learned it all during the pandemic in ways that we didn't want to. Um, obviously through the schools. I mean, I can't tell you how many hours I spent. We all, we all tried to get devices. We tried to get the internet. We tried to get the training. Teachers and students needed a lot of help without the, there was nothing proactive about that. That was last minute. So we have, I would say, just don't forget about DOE, Department of Education in this discussion. And one of the Freaking challenges is, is, is the procurement. If Gail Brewer puts money in right now, which I have for a lot of technology, you know, millions and millions of dollars, it takes two years for that technology to appear in that school. So just to give you a, a, a government response on technology, we've been trying, it's improved, but the procurement has improved, it used to be worse, but it has to improve even more. Second, um, just across the city, I mean, I have to say that um, the affordable housing broadband initiative, which supportive housing folks have uh, started, is an example. So every new supportive housing and low income, uh, I don't know if HDFCs are included in this, but they should be, would have um, the use of federal funding, because that exists now, to be able to make sure that they are all as uh, wired as any fancy new uh, high rise. So that is incredibly important. Obviously retrofitting, I would like to see. NYCHA is a big challenge. There, the mayor has put in, I think it's, I know there are three in Manhattan. There are maybe 12 or 15 around the city of, low, uh, of local uh, and for-profit and nonprofits to help wire particular developments. It's a small beginning. It's been talked about forever. I think it was a disaster in some of the, uh, I believe at Red Hook and Queensbridge, it didn't go particularly well, my understanding. You have to do it with uh, hard wire. Those walls are too thick. Don't even consider wireless. Um, and then, this, the, so NYCHA, just leave NYCHA aside because that's a whole challenge in itself, This in terms of doing it the right way. You got this last mile. You can't just rely on these um, carriers. They don't always come through. And so, because um, the cost of their uh, opportunity to uh, produce uh, internet for your home and your household is extremely expensive. 
We've got to find another way. Obviously, we're all looking. I've been dreaming of municipal broadband for the last 20 years, and it hasn't happened. So the question is, is there something else we could do that would keep the prices down? We have no competition. I'm not dreaming that we're ever gonna have competition. We don't have competition. So I would like to see as much last mile paid for um, by some of this federal funding because that might be the only way to do it. And at the same time, we have to figure out um, because I do think it's gonna be much more after the pandemic of a hybrid. If you're gonna have schools, seniors, community events, um, community boards, school boards, community government meetings. It's gonna be a hybrid, in my opinion. People want it because they liked it. They don't have to leave their home for the seniors, for the dis disabled community, it's been a godsend. So I'd like to see if we're gonna have this hybrid, it has to work. And so the question, it has to be fast, it has to be cheap, it has to be accessible, and it has to be something that people are doing just as like, they pick up the telephone. And that takes training. Now, this generation in particular, the older generation has not figured it out. Maybe as time goes on, it will be much more, um, less nuanced and they'll be able to do it just without thinking. But in this time, we have to uh, work toward a putting as much federal and state money into it as possible. And I said, it's the last mile, it's a procurement and it's a training. And it's obviously, I would like to see as much municipal as possible. Um, but I'm really excited about what the um, supportive housing folks are doing with their broadband initiatives. That's exactly what we should be doing. So one last question before we open it up to uh, our members. Um, you know that we've been advocating for increased investment into bridge programs for a very long time. And, and unfortunately, we haven't seen that fulfilled uh, during the current administration. We saw some uh, some money provided by the city council to support a obviously significant gap for us. And there there are... Uh, um, millions of dollars that are currently invested in bridge, but it simply does not meet the increased need for individuals that still have language and, and numeracy and digital uh, literacy uh, deficits here in the city. Would you, is this an area that you feel like you can support? I know that you've shown support for in the past, but is this something that you as city council speaker feel that you can support moving forward as we go into the next administration? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it was like a million dollars, which is not very much. It's just absolutely yes. Um, uh, the human services, uh, you know, are, and, and, you know, things, you know, technology is basic. I hope I made that clear with my open data bill that I passed in the city council. You know, that has been a way that we can, but if you get, if you don't have the apparatus and the knowledge as to how to use that open data, you can't participate in planning at the local level. So obviously the, the bridge program um, is something that, you know, you, if you're going to have people who are going to go into this area of technology, it has to exist in terms of the training. I keep going back to training. So the answer is absolutely yes. The career in technology has to have uh, funding in order to get there for the people who need it the most. Yes. Thank you, Gail. We're now going to go over and start to invite a couple of our speakers to ask questions. And as you may have seen in the past, we actually bring the speakers up to ask the question directly to you. Uh, so um, first up is uh, Christian Gonzalez Rivera. Uh, Christian is going to ask you a question. He is actually uh, more recently a member from our uh, New York City Inclusive Growth Initiative, a partnership we did with the Regional Plan Association and Association for Neighborhood Housing to develop a blueprint here in the city on inclusive, equitable growth. Um, Christian, you're up. Let's see, Christian. So we're gonna ask a question on his behalf. He maybe is experiencing some difficulty here, but however, his question was, how is the council, how can the council support workforce development programs and services for older workers? Okay, I, I feel very strongly about that too. We learned during the pandemic that they couldn't order food online. Um, it was, uh, really frightening. The only program that's done this successful is Oats, as we know, and I'm a big Oats fan with Tom Camber. Uh, I was there when it started, literally. The answer to the question is for the older New Yorkers, it's a question of um, literally sometimes making sure that they are part of the senior programs, that there is a funding for the kind of programs that Oats runs or others or Senior Planet, the things that Oats does. 
And then it's also for, not everybody's part of that kind of a uh, senior center. Not everybody is, although there are many more, I think. So wherever the seniors gather um, in their buildings as part of NORCs or uh, they need to have the opportunity, in my opinion, free of charge to uh, figure out how to get a device and then use it. Now, big problem. During the pandemic or just after, NYCHA bought or the mayor bought 17,000 devices for seniors at NYCHA. What a mistake because they never had training. So now the, the scene, I don't know what happened. I swear to God, I'll find some in, in closets at uh, NYCHA management offices. That's scary. Then, smart the administration is now provided to the senior centers they then call the senior and they say are you interested in a device so one center got was offered 325 it's very interesting only 225 people have signed up so that's smart so that whatever reason the other 100 didn't want it that means that the senior center is going to work directly with those seniors they're not going to sit in boxes in some closet you have to do the training so the answer to your question is whether it's a senior center or Oaks, somebody has to be one-on-one -on -one with that individual, at least through this baby boomer generation, in my opinion. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Wayne Ho, uh, who you know well, the executive director for the Chinese yes. American Planning Council. And he's also- He knows my... everything already. Go ahead. <laughs> and he's an NYCETC board member. Go ahead, Wayne. All right, thanks, Joey. Hi, Gail, good seeing you. I uh, hope you're back in New York. Um, so, as you know, uh, New York City contracts out about $4 billion a year to nonprofit human services providers. Uh, if you became the speaker, uh, how would you use that leadership position to make sure that human services nonprofits were A, paid on time, B, fully funded for services, and C, making sure that our nonprofit workforce have better wages and better benefits? Okay, I saw in the paper today that Susan and United Neighborhood Houses are, you know, point out how much you're owed. It was an astonishing amount of money. Um, I mean, I, that just can't happen. I, I would, obviously it's the mayor who controls that, but I would be very active in uh, advocacy and leadership to make sure that didn't happen. I, I don't know, I don't even know how that happened. I have no clue. I only read it in the paper today. It's outrageous. And so it would be oversight but, and fully funded uh, what happens obviously during COVID was an example. You had to provide PPE, sanitizer, um, uh, 10 times wiping down everything, uh, doing everything you could to make sure your clients and your staff did not get ill. It, it was massive. Buying um, devices for home connections. I don't know, the list was endless. And I don't think you got reimbursed for much of it. And you could, you know, God forbid, it could be a hurricane tomorrow. It could be uh, some horrible other uh, situation. Every time you have an increase because the, understandably the city, state or federal government feel that the workers should get paid more, you still have to absorb it. That should not be happening. Particularly human services are often the last on anybody's ladder. They are not, as you know, on mine. And so the better wages would come obviously with whatever the government is asking, but in order to pay people what they're worth, I'm for people getting paid as much as possible. Um, but the government contracts have to reflect that. As you know, I'm very supportive of the human services sector, probably more than, with all due respect to other sectors, more than any other sector. So city council, you know, no matter what, should be very supportive and oversight to make sure it happens. It's all about the oversight. Thank you. Um, our next question is from uh, Teresa Macchio. She is the Director of Strategic Partnerships at the American Management Association. Teresa? Teresa, whenever you're ready. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. yes, can you hear me? Go ahead. Can you hear me? No, we're, okay. we can't Good morning hear you. And for me. Um, we can't hear you, unfortunately. Uh, All right, maybe you can read you're... my question. Oh, we can hear you now. Go ahead. 
Okay, so there's no mystery that there's this conundrum of um, so many jobs that need to be filled and not enough people to fill them. And we hear so much on the news about young males of many of them of color getting into gun, uh, gun violence, gun crimes and being arrested. Why not offer them, and this is a very big project, offer them uh, job training as opposed to incarceration, because that will ultimately stop the circle of crime. Because if they had a well-paying job as a, as a, a union, a tradesman, a mason, a, a CDL truck driver, there's such need for those positions, school bus driver. Um, of course, they'd have to be under a parole situation where they're supervised, but it would, it would give them a path out of violence and out of our prison system, which is completely um, ineffectual. Thank you very much, Teresa. When you're asking a big question. Um, I've had 35 foster care kids. Many of them went to Rikers, so I'm very familiar with what it takes to try to get them on a straight path. Um, I also know that in Chicago, there was a plan that worked with many of these individuals and literally paid them to do alternative training and jobs. And it was somewhat successful. I, it's sort of what I began my conversation with is in order to get people who are marginally employed and in drug treatment, I mean, in drug selling or drug accepting, that might be what I might consider marginally employed. Certainly the gang members are also using guns, but there are drugs involved too. I would suggest that it would take, um, you know, the kind of uh, cure uh, violence programs, it takes um, trusting, and then it takes alternatives that involve money. You cannot just ask somebody to uh, leave a situation without offering them something else. So yes, but it takes a kind of intervention that I think I've begun to describe. We do not want our jails filled with these individuals. Um, it's my experience from my um, past in particular, that a lot of the people who are involved with the gangs often do not have good literacy. They often need what I would call an IEP. I know my kids were, I had several kids who needed, who had IEPs. They were constantly being uh, brought into the life by the drug dealers because they were very accepting of, uh, you know, a few dollars here, a few dollars there, and then you get into the guns and the bad stuff. So it takes um, a real shift and it take, but well, I just keep emphasizing, you can't do it by waking up one day. It takes a massive amount of funding. I know the mayor's action plan map has been trying. Um, the programs in Harlem have been trying. Um, you have to be trusted. You can't, it has to be a trusting situation to get people to change their lifestyle. But then it takes the funding to give them something. You can't go immediately from drug selling to truck driver or to uh, construction. That's where you have to have the support that is very, very massive. That's my experience. And I have to say, um, people often don't have the education and they need to have lots of these jobs have GED challenges. Um, so the question is what barriers are needed and what barriers are not needed. So I, I guess because I have a lot of experience, I was also on a drug treatment board for 25 years. Um, I know it takes, takes 18 months, literally, to get out of uh, substance abuse. It, it does not happen overnight. So um, I'm just very realistic about how you get from point A to point B. It can be done, but you can't do it without a lot of support. So I'm gonna ask a couple of questions just given some of the technical issues on behalf of some of our, our participants. Um, Helen Kogan, uh, she's the executive director of NPower and an NYCTC board member. Her question was, how do we incentivize industry to invest and to continue to invest in New York City and work more directly with the workforce development system? How do we incentivize the tech industry you're talking about? I'm sorry. Was, no, was not necessarily the tech industry, just business community in general to invest in oh, New York. Okay. okay, the business community. All right, I think that makes sense. Um, business community, and again, I'm sure there are people on who are from chambers or from bids or from the business community or from the partnership. They want predictability. So they want to know if Empower or Exodus or Strive is going to send them, I'm making this up, 10 workers. They want to know that those 10 workers are trained. They want to know that they can count on them and that there's backup in case somebody isn't able to do the job. So I think that's what the business, that's my understanding as to what the business community wants. That's not necessarily uh, the union job or 
you know, but in terms of the traditional corporate, traditional um, health company, et cetera, uh, that's what they want. Now, NPOW in particular has done a phenomenal job of actually doing that. You know, they, they know their, uh, they know the industries and, and they have built up relationships with them and uh, they've been very successful. And I think probably that's true of many of your members. That's what the business community wants. So they know that, you know, I know that, uh, for instance, the folks at JP Morgan work a lot with veterans, uh, veterans who may not have had a chance the first time, but they get trained and then they work very successfully at JP Morgan Chase. So I think that's the answer, the simple answer to your question. Now getting there is not so easy, but that too is what the, I think the business community wants. Same with the, you know, you hear hospitality, doesn't have workers, et cetera. I don't know exactly who is training for the hospitality industry right now and what kind of support they're doing. They also, you know, they wanna be paid wages that are gonna give them the opportunity to raise a family and not some poverty wages so that they also end up getting uh, food stamps, SNAP slash other kinds of benefits. You know, it's, it's interesting. I was at a store yesterday you know, these small delis are doing what they can, but everybody in that deli was getting food stamps, SNAP, slash, um, other kinds of benefits. So it's a strange situation when you're working full time and you're trying to figure out how to get your benefits from the government. That is what the conversation goes on in every single one of our small stores or fast food, et cetera. I don't know if that's what we want. It's not what I want. So that's the question is how do you figure out? It seems to me that the more conservative Americans might want to know that people are, you know, not taking advantage of having to take advantage of government programs if they're working full time. They should get it, uh, you know, some kind of a salary that would enable them to do that. Now that's hard on the business community. So you got to have some kind of discussion back and forth. I understand that, but you know, the big corporations, it's the same old story. Get a lot of breaks, and the small stores and smaller businesses do not. So how do you balance all of that? But right. the workers have to be able to. Um, they have to be reliable for the company and they have to be paid something so that they're going to have a living wage. Right. Um, our next question is from uh, Robert Tucker. Uh, Robert is the owner of Black and White Training LLC. Um, his question is, how do you plan to make the process of bidding on city contracts more transparent oh. and accessible <laughs> for minority and women-owned businesses? Okay, my understanding is that the MBEWB, I could be wrong, but I thought it was like really... 3.8% or something terrible right now. I could be wrong. I think it's not great. No, I think and I know the number is correct. It's between three and 4%. Oh, yeah, it's pretty bad. And it's supposed to be 30%. And I think the state, I don't know what the state is, but I believe it's higher. That's my understanding. So um, this this contract situation, um, this, I don't want to say, because I don't know for sure. I don't think it is very well monitored. I don't think that the agency is taken seriously. Um, despite a lot of talk, I'm not saying there's not been a lot of talk, but I don't feel that the, it, it, let me give an example. I have many friends who are MBWBs. They do not want to work with the city of New York. They don't want to have anything to do with it. They much rather uh, work with a, you know, a large corporation, a bank or a tech company or something like that, because there's so much rigmarole, even to apply, it's supposed to be easier to get to be an MBWE and then to to go through, as we just heard from Robert, the contracting process. So many of them just say, you know, I don't want to work with you. I can get my money elsewhere. And so we're losing some of the best MBE, WBEs who don't want to work with government. So the question is how to make a process that is both, you know, you want to make sure that it's, you have to be very careful about fraud, you know, so it's not, it's really an MBE, WBE and not a, uh, you know, pretending to be, which has happened in the past, we know that. But so the issue is both um, trying to do more outreach to more companies, because the companies are there. Then the question is how to make them, you know, real GCs and not just sub, 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 subs, and how to have, the other problem is this, when I, I'm the borough president, we want furniture, we want, um, you know, uh, stationary, so the, this is another challenge that hasn't been addressed. And I don't know the answer to this one. So the city says the taxpayer, you and me, need to get the best buck for our dollar. So we're gonna go with Staples. Try to order anything besides, I think it's Staples, but some large company. Same thing with the furniture. I wanna go with the MBWBE. You can't, you gotta go with the vendor that the city has selected. 
It's very hard. And we work in our office to try to get every penny paid to an MBE, WBE. You'd be surprised how hard it is. So there's a lot of uh, challenges. Are we, you know, how do we make sure? Because this is certainly possible. More effort has to go into the taxpayer can get the same benefit from an MBE, WBE than at, at, uh, from a large company. Right. Somebody should look. This would be a, a city council effort. What is the oversight of the large corporations that are getting the city contracts versus the MBWB? So I hope that's a short version to a very long, excellent question, but that's been my experience. Not a good one. Yeah, it's unfortunate. And, and there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and I think it, it, you know, along the lines of what you described. Um, our final question um, is specifically about an initiative that I, I uh, loosely mentioned earlier that Christiane was a part of. Uh, which is called the New York City Inclusive uh, Growth uh, Initiative. Uh, and we, over the summer, we produce an inclusive growth blueprint uh, with 50 plus yeah. recommendations. The, the report itself in partnership with the steering committee, the Association for Neighborhood Housing and Regional Plan Association uh, was a list of recommendations and a strategy for how the city can grow equitably anchored on workforce, economic development and affordable housing. Um, and really specifically, it, it also talks about prioritizing infrastructure and development pro projects that proactively address long-standing disparities and meet the material needs of New Yorkers, especially those that have been marginalized and left behind uh, and left out of decision-making processes. Were there any specific recommendations uh, that you can speak of that you found uh, will help you in your role on the city council um, uh, address uh, the, the growing inequity that we've seen in the city uh, that, and that you mentioned earlier today? Well, I mean, I think I think we're on the same page in terms of some of the, I haven't read the whole thing, Jose. I, can, I, I looked at it. I'm going to be honest with you. I have not That's read fair. all. I have read it's Jonathan Bowles' 200 suggestions, so I just want to let you know. Um, but I I would say that the, the it's one thing to talk about this, uh, these ideas, like how do we make sure that we're resilient? How do we make sure we have green jobs? How do we make sure we have affordable housing? Maybe because I've been doing it for a long time it, and trying. It's hard. So I think the answer to the question specifically is I hope I keep going back to, you have to invest in the beginning, in the front end in order to accomplish these things. And, and then you have to figure out what the, what the challenges are. With the affordable housing, I mean, that's what I know the best. Converting these hotels, just as an example, which would involve jobs, which would involve affordable housing, which involve technology, which involve all the things we've been talking about. It turns out that there's some law department reason as to why nothing can go from a hotel to a rent stabilized unit. You can't imagine. So the, all what, what I take with the blueprint as an example is going through each recommendation and figuring out what the challenge is to implementing it. That's how I would approach it. Because if you don't do that, then you all you do is talk and you don't get there. And the smallest issues can trip you up, procurement being the biggest one perhaps. But you end up uh, tripping up because you haven't put the uh, up front, what are the challenges to making this specific recommendation implemented? And then the second issue is, you know, obviously part of that would be how can you make sure that people who are marginally employed or not employed get, get employed and get good jobs? That would be one of the ways to look at it. And then the second, are there any legal barriers? Um, are there any funding barriers? And how do we get there? So I guess the answer, I hope my best answer would be they're all excellent recommendations, but how do you actually implement them? And that's where I think I'm best qualified, to be honest with you, on making uh, this job or this city council real, working with the mayor, but making sure that, and you need oversight. And sometimes you just can't get to the place that you want. So oversight is what the council can do too. So that concludes the second of our conversations with the city council speaker candidates. Uh, Borough President Brewer, it was really great to see you. Thank you as always for your support and for being here with us this morning. Thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, continuing to work with you in whatever role I have to say, and I'm gonna say it over and over again, that the work that you provide as the coalition uh, chair, so to speak, is very impressive. We have a great group. Um, but the relationships and the know-how that you provide with your members is perhaps you, unique in this city. I saw it with the Fair Chance Act. Um, and I think that that teamwork is the absolute only way to make the city a better place. And that's why I'm running is I want government 
to work for everybody, not just for a certain number of people. Thanks so much, Gail. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, you too. A quick program note. Uh, due to a scheduling conflict, tomorrow's discussion with Keith Powers has been postponed to December 7th. Join us on Wednesday, November 10th, when we speak with Justin Brandon, followed by Diana Ayala on Tuesday, November 30th, Councilmember Adrian Adams on Friday, December 3rd, and Keith Powers again, uh, now scheduled for December 7th, Francisco Moyes on December 16th, and other announcements to come in the following days. Thank you all for joining us this morning. And of course, I want to thank again, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer for her leadership and for being here with us this morning. and wish her the best of luck on her candidacy as a speaker. Enjoy the rest of your day.